So today we have the distinct honor to interview for leaders of character, Mrs. Indra Nui, one of the most character-driven, amazing women that I have ever met. Um, I have been fortunate to hear from her several times now and learn valuable lessons. Ms. Indra Nui started her career um, in business. The majority of her career was spent with PepsiCo, where she ended as CEO and chairman, growing revenues up to $65 billion by more than 80%, and also showing that diversity actually increases performance and inspiring millions of women to follow in her footsteps. Mm -hmm. Now she has the distinct honor of serving on the board of directors of Amazon, and more importantly, helping shape the next generation of leaders of character as a visiting faculty member at the United States Military Academy at West Point, and also is currently writing a book that is going to also have a significant impact on the next generation. So ma'am, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us today to impact the next generation of leaders and for us to have a candid conversation because the, the first step to creating change is, is having candid conversations mm -hmm. and understanding things because some of the topics today I don't fully understand or I can't have the perspective on certain things such as being a white male. I don't understand that perspective of growing up as a diverse mm -hmm. woman um, in a male dominated world, but I can gain that perspective and people can gain that perspective from great leaders like you. And understanding is something that we feel is, is the number one way to actually creating lasting change. So I can't thank you enough for coming here today to speaking with us, to sharing wisdom and helping us really make the next generation better than your generation. So we can also make the next generation after us better. So thank you, thank Max, you for so having much, me. Man. It's a real privilege being on the show and thank you for inviting me to speak with you. Well, thank you. For, first and foremost, one of the most incredible things is that you were ranked the number one most influential woman in business by Fortune magazine. And, and rightly so, as you've shattered numerous uh, glass ceilings, broken many barriers, and you became the first woman to lead a Fortune 100 company, which is absolutely incredible accomplishment. First off, congratulations. Uh, how... And what do you think inspired you and kept you going to achieve such amazing accomplishments in your life? So, Max, first of all, I have to tell you that those lists, those fortune lists and Forbes list of women, you end up on those only because you've performed. Because the minute you stop performing, you're thrown off the list. And so it's sort of a, uh, a scary thing to be on the list. Second thing is when you're number one, there's no other place to go but down. So it's an even more frightening place to be on. But let me just tell you, right through my life, um, I never aspired for the next job because I always felt that because of my background, my ethnicity, the fact that I was uh, you know, a female uh, in a very different culture and environment, because I grew up in one country, I was in corporate life in a different country. Uh, I never thought I'd make it to anything beyond what I was doing. So I just focused on doing the job I was doing exceedingly well. That was my only focus. Promotions just happened and the ascension to the CEO was a complete surprise. And uh, it's just an indication that if you do the job that you're given exceedingly well, without thinking about the next job and the next job, which means that you are more worried about your uh, ascension in the company and the politics to get to the top, um, you know, it, it, just the wrong approach. Just focus on doing the job you're doing exceedingly well. And that's all I did all my life. Uh, if, if my job was sort of defined narrowly, I always defined it broadly because I wanted to know how my job was going to fit into other people's jobs. So I was always trying to zoom out to understand what more I could do to make my work more relevant to others. So now in retrospect, people tell me that got me noticed. At that point, I thought that was my job to not just do my job, but to see how it fit into other people's jobs. So when you put the company and the job um, over yourself, which is what I did, uh, the rest of it just happened. What, what do you think allowed you to break that glass ceiling of becoming the, the first woman to lead a Fortune 100 company? Um, you know, I came into the workforce at a time when there weren't too many women. And 
uh, you know, even though I faced a lot of resistance, it wasn't anything like people face today. Uh, people sort of looked at me and said, my God, here's a woman, one of the few in our circles who's doing such a good job, let's give her support. So I see on, a, on balance, I got more support than I did opposition, which is a very good thing that helped me. And all my mentors were males, Max, and uh, they went out of their way to lift me up, provide me the tailwind, tailwinds, and I'm deeply grateful to them. Uh, and so right through my life, I did my part, they did their part. Now, it's not just they told me that I was awesome. When I didn't do something right, they hauled me in and said, let me tell you what you're doing wrong and what I would do if I were you, how to fix what you're doing. So uh, they gave me strong advice. They gave me constructive advice and I listened. I didn't immediately say they don't want me to succeed. So I was open-minded and this combination allowed me to make myself better and keep doing the job I was doing. I think I had an, I had an, I had an added benefit, which is, you know, I was an immigrant, person of color, female. And every time I went into a job, I viewed myself as being in a hole. Because I said, I'm so different. People are gonna view me negatively, so I'm in a hole. So I knew I had to do exceedingly well to first get out of the hole and then perform. What I did not realize is that people didn't put me in the hole. I put myself in the hole. So my performance was way better than anybody else. In fact, I think I intimidated more people because of the quality of the work I did. Now, it came at a tremendous personal cost, but at that point, I just wanted to do well. What were one of the watchouts of falling short of that goal and of what you accomplished? It's a personal thing. Um, remember, the goal was not to be CEO. The goal was to keep the job. The goal was to... Uh, you know, make sure that I contributed positively to any corporation or entity I was a part of. So that was my barometer, not did I get a promotion? Did I get a big raise? I don't think I ever asked for a raise or a promotion. So that was not the indicator that I was looking at. Um, the consequences are if you don't do well, when you get to senior jobs, Max, you get thrown out. And so, uh, you know, the, the shame of losing your job for performance, you know, losing your job because their job is eliminated is a different thing, but losing your job because you didn't perform. Uh, culturally for us, it's a big shame because, uh, you know, culturally I was always brought up saying, if you're given a job, you do it well, or don't be in that job, let somebody else do it. And you know, you've got to give it your head, heart and hands. That's the only way I know how to do things. And that's the way I did it. What was it like growing up in business as a woman of Indian descent in a male dominated industry? Like I said, every place you went into, you felt like you were in a hole. And remember the times that I grew up in, there were hardly any women. I never had a woman boss. There were very few peers were women. Uh, and so I could be in meetings with 50, 100 men and I'd be the only woman, okay? So at that point, you don't think of yourself as a woman. You just think of yourself as one of the guys and you just have to hold your own. You're focused on holding your own. I think I got stronger because at every point in time, I was watching, you know, 99 guys and me, you know, 99% were men, right? I was watching them to see how they behaved, how they acted. Not that I wanted to act like a man, don't get me wrong, but I watched what it takes to build confidence, what it takes to articulate your point of view. And then I had mentors who were men who told me, you know, don't do this, do this, sit up straight, you know, articulate clearly, be more pithy. They taught me so much. So I think in a way, I was lucky to have risen in, corp in the corporate world at the time that I did, because I was so unique. I was not viewed as competition. I was viewed most of the time as an interesting addition to the team. Okay, only recently are people viewing women as real competition to them. In my time, it was, huh, she's interesting. She works her tail off. Uh, she uh, helps us out when we're stuck. And she saves our ass now and then. So they liked all of that. <laughs> are, do you think corporations are doing a better job today at developing and supporting women? I think they don't have a choice, Max, because if you look at high school valedictorians, 70% of them are women more than 50% of the top grades in colleges are women. 
60% of the professional degrees are being gotten by women. Women are hungry. They want to do better. They want financial freedom. They want economic freedom. They don't want to be caught in any situation where they're helpless, dependent on somebody that is not fully dependent, uh, not fully dependable. And so when you have women who are performing so well, for us to get the best and the brightest into the company and move ahead, we have to recruit from the whole pool, not just half the pool. And so the minute you went, go to the whole pool to pick out the best and the brightest, you get a large number of women in your interview pool. And if you want to get the best out of them, you have to create an environment where they can contribute. Because if you bring in the best and brightest who are also women, then you uh, throw all kinds of roadblocks in their way. You're just going to strip their confidence. And if you strip their confidence, you're going to strip their competence. What a waste. So you ought not to look at them as women and men. You ought to look at them as incredible assets to move the company forward. So if you look at them as you know, real engines of, dry, of business growth and performance, it's a whole different approach than saying, oh, yeah, these women. You know, it's your mindset that has to change. The big challenge is a lot of the young leaders of today, the bosses are still the boomer generation or the generation after me. Uh, who are still getting used to having a lot of women in the work, workplace. I think the millennials are much more comfortable with working with a lot of women. So as there's a generational shift, I think you'll see a lot more comfort with women. And this conversation about women and men, I hope, just goes away to the best talent. What, what do you think corporations can do to maximize their talent? Uh, overall, I think uh, corporations should think mm -hmm. about how to use the talent, um, not as just tools of the trade, but as human beings that come with families, communities, uh, the worries and you know, tribulations of you know, managing a life as opposed to just the work. And so companies ought to be thinking about uh, how to allow them to integrate the two. Wonderful thing about COVID Max is it allowed us to think about flexibility. How can you work at home and still do your job? How can you work some days at work, some days at the home? So COVID actually taught us a lot. Uh, and that allows people to balance work and family just a little bit more because it saves you computing, commuting time. And if you don't have to be on nine to five in a job, you actually have more degrees of freedom and still get the job done. Uh, and so for companies to get the best out of their people, they've got to make sure that they provide some flexibility. They provide ability for people to go have a family or to care for a sick relative because unfortunately, that's all part of life. You can't tell people if you have a sick parent that you have to care for, especially if they're terminally ill, tough luck, you just can't get paid. I mean, people need a, the power of the paycheck to live. Um, and then I'd say for young family builders, uh, you know, the country needs children. We need 2.1 children per family. Right now we're at 1.6 or 1.7. If you wanna have uh, families having children, where families become a source of strength, not a source of stress. You have to find some way to provide some childcare help because you, know, you can't have a baby and drop it in the field after two weeks or two months and come back to work. You need a care infrastructure. So I think some combination of paid leave, flexibility and um, childcare can actually go a long way to bringing in not just the women, young family builders into the job and keeping them happy and worry-free, stress-free, reduce their stresses. And, and that's necessary for what Pepsi, I've, I've heard that Pepsi wants their workforce and their demographic of their workforce to emulate the demographic of their consumers and race, religion, ethnicity. How far has Pepsi come with that? Or what can they do to actually achieve that? So the reason we say that our employee base should reflect our consumer base is because, you know, we sell to everybody in the world. There isn't anybody we don't sell to. So let's just take the U.S. Every person in the U.S. is a potential customer, right? We don't make jet engines or heavy equipment. We make simple pleasures in life. Everybody's entitled to simple pleasure in life. So we want to be able to tell everybody in the population, um, we want all of you to have a chance to work in our company. Just perform you can work in our company. And so we, we don't want to discriminate 
based on your background or gender or whatever. We just want to hire the best and the brightest. That's it. And for people who have not grown up in an environment where they can be you know, highly uh, sought after because they grew, in, grew up in an environment, lots of role models, we bring in people who we think have potential but haven't had the role models and the support and we develop them in the company. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. Aunt Jemima is a product we owned, the pancake mix. Now the name has been changed. Um, the Aunt Jemima product was typically for African-American or black families. Yet the team that was running Aunt Jemima was all white. Now, I have nothing wrong with that team because, you know, typically those people go out and study the African-American community a lot more. But it would be much easier if you also had black people on that team so that the decision making will improve. Right. So we don't do this as a corporate social responsibility, Max. We do it because to get the best decisions, the best thinking into the decisions that we make as a company, we have to have diversity. Right. And for all the consumers we are serving, all of those consumer voices should be in the decision making uh, in the company. So for us, it was a question of business growth, economic success, nothing else. Moving back to your point about having both people in the workforce and, and kind of the challenges that, that, mm -hmm. that you talked about. I mean, you said on your, your final day at Pepsi, a couple key things, but one was that it's rarely possible to be the perfect mother, wife, and worker at the same time. And understanding this conflict is the first step to finding solutions. What, what suggestions do you have to help women find that balance between being a successful business leader, a mother, and partner at home, all of which are three full-time jobs? And then obviously, depending on the culture you're in, maybe you have a, you have a, you have a fourth full-time job. So it's not just women. I think we ought to say, how do we allow society to do it? Because once we make it a woman's problem, we tell them make checklists, be more organized. You know, that's all fine and dandy. I think the real issue is um, we have to start off saying women are half the population. Um, if you don't hire from that half of the population, which is so smart, the company is not going to do so well. Right. If, on the other hand, you do hire from that population and they have to work so hard with no support system and they don't have kids, population is not going to grow, which is not good for the country. Mm -hmm. You need a replacement rate level of growth in our country. Okay? Uh, clearly, we have immigration as a, a gap filler. We can use immigration, but why not grow our own kids? And the only way to do that is by providing support for all young family builders to have families. You know, to me, when somebody is gonna have a child, they ought to get a letter from the president saying, thank you for your service to the country. As much as I do, if you serve the country as a member of the US military. And the reason I say that, Max, is because um, when you have a child and all the troubles you go through to deliver the child, bring up the child, um, you're doing the service, you're doing a service to the country you are helping improve or increase the population of the country. And not only are you bringing this child in, you're also committing to bring up this child in a way that that child becomes a good citizen of the country. But you can't do it alone. Yeah, because for many people, life is fragile. Families break up at times. You can have a crisis in the family where you don't have the financial means to support yourself. You need both people working. If you want to create wealth, both the husband and wife have to work to create wealth for the future, to put away money for retirement. Given all that, women need to have the power of the purse. Women need to have economic freedom. And so we all have to get together and say, what are we going to do to encourage both? Allow them to be in paid work and have kids. That's my book. All about <laughs> But getting getting to that solution, one of the first things we have to do is understand that that there is a problem. And if we're looking at the statistics right now, there is a problem because ideally we want to look at everybody just socially and say everybody has a responsibility. But looking at Harvard, Harvard Business Review studies and everything, it showed that more the more successful a man is, the more likely they are to find a spouse and be a father, whereas the opposite is holding true for women right now, where the majority of high achieving women do not have kids. They're either divorced or they were never married. Mm -hmm. Now you you hit the trifecta at work. Um, 
as a parent, uh, as, as a wife and as a businesswoman, but st- statistics right now suggest that you're an exception, mm. not necessarily the rule. Can women today and tomorrow have it all? Um, a successful c- career, children and relationship. Um, when statistics are showing that they've struggled in the past and they still are struggling today to do that. So first thing is, if you want to get married, okay, make sure you pick the right guy. Critically important, critically important. You've got to have the honest conversations with your spouse on equality at home. Both are going to help. One's not going to watch TV while the other one is working all the time. Okay, So it's got to be both are going to contribute to the family. Both are going to further the family's uh, success. So both have to commit to working equally. Second is you've got to let go of perfection, especially women. Uh, we want to be perfect at everything. doesn't work. There's so much to do. There's no time to be perfect at everything. You've got to let go of perfection. Uh, third is that guilt will overcome you. Uh, remember, guilt is not something you can just get rid of overnight. Just say, I'm not going to feel guilty anymore. It's going to overcome you. Figure out how to wait to handle it. Because if it consumes you, then you're always uncertain whether you should keep working. And then when you quit your job and stay home, you wonder why you quit your job and stayed home because you feel like you've lost your identity or sense of self-worth. It's a very complex thing. Um, and so I think that uh, you know, what we have to do to get the trifecta is marry the right person, have the conversations, let go of perfection, handle guilt properly, and know that um, every day there's going to be trade-offs you make. Every day, every hour sometimes, there are trade-offs you'll be making. Uh, it's okay to make those trade-offs. It's okay. Sometimes you might say, am I going to go out and have a drink with my friends or am I going to go home and be with the kids and the family? That's your choice. I never went out and had a drink with the friends and hung out when my kids were small. For me, it was simple. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to go home to the family. Period. End of subject. I didn't feel I missed anything. But all every time, you're going to have to make some of these choices. And as long as you recognize that um, major decisions are not going to be made at the bar, and nobody's going to exclude you from decisions if you choose to go home and be with your kids, that's okay. But then it comes back to the first thing I said, Max. If you are a terrific performer and you are so good at what you do, people cannot not include you in their decision making. So the biggest investment you can make is to be supremely um, outstanding in the work you're doing. So people look at themselves and say, our decision-making is going to be so much better if Indra was here in the room. And I think maybe that's why I got to where I was. Because um, wherever I went, I wanted to make the whole better as opposed to just endorse the whole. No, I mean, obviously you raised two incredible daughters that are, are going on to do great things, but that burden of guilt still has to weigh on you a bit. And you talked about that a little bit in your last day. A bit, (laughs) a lot. But that's, you know, part of the course because my kids remind me, oh, you were not here, but I was there for every event that they had, every school event I was Mm -hmm. there. I was on the school board. I never missed a single board of trustees meeting. If they sprained their ankle, I was the first mother who rushed to school. Of course, they tell me, mom, you're embarrassing us. Why did you show up? Because the nurse called and told me you sprained your ankle. So I'm here. So I was always there, but you know, with kids, it's interesting. Um, On the one hand, especially with the moms, they use them as punching bags, okay? At the same time, they also respect those moms who work. So this is one of these uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Do you think it's harder for women on average to deal with the guilt of not being there for their children as much as it is for fathers? I think it's in our genetic makeup. Guilt is into our, is embedded into our gene pool. And so women feel a lot more guilt. I think recently I'm hearing a lot from the men too, that they too feel like they missed out on their children's development or mixed out, missed out on family time. And I can understand that. But women just you know, have it in abundance, let's put it that way. Right. 
It consumes you. Right. Even now, I'm looking at uh, pic pictures of my kids when they were babies, you know, little chubby things. And I, where was I? How did I miss all this? I was there, but I, I still miss it, you know? You, you kept a note from your daughter. She wrote you a note when, when she was really little saying, yeah. I love you, but I, I really miss, miss, miss you. And I'd love you more if you were home more. Yep. And, and you, you kept that note. Why, why did you keep that note? Because it reminded me that um, for all the success, there were also, you know, some collateral uh, damage, if you want to call it, where my kids really miss me. Please, 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 please come home. I still keep it in my desk. But um, um, look, we are all people because we have a family around us. We have people who love us, people who center us, people who make sure we don't start thinking we are way bigger than we are. Right. Um, uh, I love my family. I mean, they're my everything. And as you get older, you they become dearer to you. Right. And so when your kids, however old they are, walk in and they give you a big hug, it's such a great feeling, Max. And so uh, they, those notes, and I have many of them from my two daughters, they remind me of how much they loved me then, how much they love me now. And what an important role parents have to play in children's lives. Do you think having children makes you more inclined to success or do you think it detracts from somebody's ability to be ambitious and become very successful? That's a leading question. See, children are more work. There's no question about it. If you think you can just have children and say there's no more work, forget it. It's a lot of work. And as the children grow, they need you more and more. It's not that they need you less. So children are a lot of work. And while they need you, the pyramid in the organization is narrowing. So you have to study more and more and read more and more to move up in the pyramid. So the biological clock, the career clock are both oh, in raging conflict with each other. But that's life. And so um, I think having children is a lot of work, but it gives you a third dimension of softness. And it also teaches you how to mentor and develop people because you're developing and mentoring people at work all the time as you are your kids. It makes you a fuller person. It also allows you to understand the trials and tribulations of what other people go through. Because when you don't have kids and we don't really have a family, you expect everybody else to perform like you are. And they can't because they have families too. Right. Businesses are systematically trying to help with some of those issues. One of them yeah. is many companies are allowing women to freeze their eggs um, as a way to try to systematically help that but that also has a whole host of issues because as women are waiting longer in their lives to have kids, number one, it's a very painful uh, process. But number two, it also is never easier to have kids as you progress through the corporate ladder right. either. So they're systematically trying to find ways, but kind of that solution holds a whole host of issues in it of itself. How can businesses try yeah. to systematically help women have it all? Um, where they're not doing the best job right now at, at it. So, you know, in a way, I'm glad that companies are now paying for egg freezing costs. That's fine. But the better thing is uh, encouraging people to have kids earlier with providing the child care support. But with okay. child care, I mean, you, you've taught I me mean, the child care system is when you're thinking about leaving probably your most valuable asset, your children with child care workers that are, getting paid less than grocery clerks. Which How is could ridiculous. somebody feel comfortable doing yeah. that? It's ridiculous. If we don't start looking at child care workers, care workers, both child care and senior care workers, and saying, what's a fair wage for them? You know, Max, we are entrusting our most vulnerable to people who don't get paid much. It's right. not fair. I mean, it's like, um, I'm not saying money is the only motivator for people. Many of these care workers do such a great job. Sure. And I just think it's wrong for society to look at them and say, your job is not much. Mm -hmm. You're just a glorified babysitter. Because what happens is when we are young, we are spoiled by local neighborhood babysitters who are willing to do the job for a pittance. But they're all school kids, high school right. kids or you know college kids who are willing to do this as an add-on job. But don't make the entire care employee system high school kids. Right. You know, don't pay them like that. So I think if there's one debate and discussion and move to action that needs to happen, it's paying the care workers the right amount of money, 
major piece of work that needs to happen fast. I mean, I mean, this isn't a political debate. I mean, this is economically, That's correct. it's a necessity. I mean, you, you talked about the 1.6 to 1.7 children that my yeah. generation is going to need to have to take care of the older generation. So That's people right. are what 10,000 people a week are becoming 65 and then 75. We are going to have to pay for the Medicaid and Medicare uh-huh. and whatnot, but there's, there's no incentive to do that because number one, like, like you were talking about, it's, it's very difficult because if, if we are going to grow at that 2.1 rate, both people have to work in a relationship and they have to have kids. But now you're saying that we're going to give our most valuable resource to somebody that society doesn't value. So now you're, one person is probably going to stay home or you're going to be incentivized. I would have less kids rather than more but kids. Max, if, you're, if somebody... you're summarizing the problem in a nutshell. That is the problem in a nutshell. So what are the ways around this? Uh, you know, with a combination of paid leave, flexibility and care, right? you can manage through things because you can tell people work out of home some days, come to work some days. For days that you come to work, we'll have childcare. So if you work that equation carefully, you can help families, you know, balance the two. But we have to stop treating five plus um, schooling as a societal responsibility, right. but zero to five being an individual responsibility. Mm-hmm. That's what we're doing. We put down public school education, five plus into the tax base, right? We pay for schooling in our tax base. I've, I've never five. thought about it like that. That's, that's a great point. Zero to five, except when states have Head Start, we basically look at zero to five as an individual responsibility. Now, there's another way to look at this to say, when the child is zero to five, if one of the parents chooses not to work and stay home, okay, uh, and take care of the kids full time, it's okay. But that's if you have one kid. Right. If you have two kids, it's immediately seven years. If you have three kids, it's 10 years. You know, the zero to five has to go through, right? The minute you get that done, you're completely irrelevant in the workforce. Because if you're out of the workforce for five to 10 years, it's very hard to come back in. The return ramps are not very good. And so we have to get practical about this issue, Max, really practical. So, but but even with paid time, so obviously there's something that is, is, is a big problem now, but then there's second and third order effects, right? So we, we figure out uh, maternity and paternity leave, right? So we get people, but, but regardless, if women are paid or not, they're out of the competition for the period of time that they're having kids. So if you have two, three kids, even if uh, financially, if, if you're coming up in, in the military or in investment banking, you're missing very crucial experiences, either that being in the military side of deployment or maybe multiple deals that you could be learning uh, uh, as analysts, which, which also is, is hurting. How do you f- fix or, or help with that? So in my life, I had my father who was terminally ill. I had to take care of him. Right. I was in a car crash. I was out for three months. I had two kids. For my two kids, I got 12 weeks of maternity leave. For my car crash, I got three months off with pay. And my father was terminally ill. They gave me three months off with pay. So net, net, almost a year of vacation I got from my employers over time. Mm-hmm. But through that time when I was away, I just didn't sit there doing nothing. I kept in touch with the work that was going on, the industry going on. When I right. came back, I wasn't completely behind the scenes. I mean, behind the um, rest of the class. And so it's also what you do. Okay, But now, I want to be practical. If you're caring for a sick relative, sometimes it takes all your time. So you don't right. have time to. So you will fall back a little bit. If you think you want to stay well within your class and move with them, move with your cohort group, it's going to be very hard to do it while you have family burdens. Very hard. That's why a lot of people have stress about families and keeping the job and moving lockstep with everybody else. A lot of stress is associated with that. So will women always have to work a little bit harder than men to achieve the same things unless there's systematic things in place within corporations to, to help do that? Systematic things and... Um, and uh, society basically saying men and women have this conversation about how we can share the right. responsibility. Not, don't call it a burden. 
call it sharing the privilege of bringing up the kids. You right. want to look at the kids as a privilege. I mean, look at that. When you, I didn't know what love was until I had kids. <laughs> and I, I love my husband, but the love you have for your kids is a whole new uh, dimension of love. From the deepest part of your heart, you know, you show love. Why? Why do these conversations not happen more? Why? Why do tough and candid conversations not happen as much as they probably should? Yeah, I. Um, I went back and I looked at the laws. When President Nixon was president, he almost signed in a universal child care law in the country and got pulled at the last minute. I think two, this is some of his hypothesis. Okay, one is uh, most of the decision making is still men in power. Right. And I think men have to come to the table to say, we have to make a difference. Um, the second thing is um, there's a preference in the eyes of many people for women to stay home. You know, why should women have freedom of the purse? Why should women have economic freedom, financial freedom? Why should women compete in the workforce? So there are people who genuinely feel like women should stay home. They don't like this equality discussion. Look, I'm not sitting here going, uh, I'm fighting for equality. No, I'm just fighting for the best and brightest to be in the workforce. Right. And if you fight for that, automatically you'll get to equality. So I'm not starting with equality. I'm starting with the best and brightest. But the the first step is starting. And and right now, obviously, in today's society, there's a, there's a strong cancel culture. Some people are even fearful to start a conversation or to have con- candid conversations. What do you think about that? I don't know why they're not having the conversations. I look at the research, Max. There's so much research that's been done. There's so many conversations that are had. It right. doesn't lead to action. Right. And that's, I think, recently I'm seeing some movement that people want to address childcare, want to address female participation. But if we treat this as a charitable program or we have to employ women because if we don't, we'll get into trouble, that's the wrong reason. You've got to think about we're going to hire women because they are wicked smart and they'll get it done. That's the reason you should hire the women, not say, God, if I don't hire women, I'll have all these women activists shouting at my door. Right. But, but don't but, hire the women and put every barrier in front of her. It's not fair. Right. Y- young people right now are probably more inspired than ever to make change due to recent events, due to mm. all different types of, of motivators. But it's very difficult for, for young people to make change. So how do you take advantage of this situation where all these young people that want to make change, they want to do good, but they just don't know how, what, what would you tell them? You know, they, this is where the older generation can be of help. You know, the young people today know a lot more than many of us know. I'll be honest with you. They're so wicked smart. All of you are educated through social media. Uh, I mean, I feel great about the generations after me because I think all of you are just, Uh, giving, you want to make a difference, and you're super smart. Um, But if you need advice on how to make change, how to get dialogue started, we can help. Not everybody in my generation, but many people in our generation are willing to help. The other great thing you have, Max, is you've got social media. You can crowdsource for ideas. And everybody will jump in and give you ideas. So nobody says, I don't want to give Max an idea on how to do this better. Everybody wants to lean in to provide an idea. So I think this power of crowdsourcing, the power of asking digitally for ideas is a unique privilege, again, that you have. Right. So I think it's more important is not to be shameful about asking for advice. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. What, What are resources or ways that somebody should go about that? So if somebody's looking for a mentor or looking for resources, where would you tell a young person to go? to find purpose or, or find how to actually affect change or, or use their inspiration to do good in the world? First of all, if you want a mentor, mentors pick you, you can't pick them. A real mentor picks you because they see something in you that they like and right. they want to hitch their wagon to you. So mentors are actually selfish. They say, you know, I want to mentor Mac because I see something in him. I know he's going to become a four-star general. I want to be able to say I played a part in it. Okay, so it's a real um, mentors pick you because 
they see something in you. But it doesn't mean some people will never have a mentor. You right. can have people you go to for advice. You can have people that you go to for, um, you know, how do I get myself out of this predicament kind of a question. But are they going to advocate for your career and support you explicitly? Mm -hmm. Probably not. They're going to have a handful of people that each one mentors. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing with mentors, Max, is people don't understand is if a mentor gives you a suggestion and you don't take it, you got to go back and tell them why you didn't take it. Because if mentors keep giving ideas and you ignore them, they're going to say one day, why am I giving Max any ideas? He never listens to me anyway. So my practice is if I get an advice, piece of advice from a mentor, I always go back to them and say, remember that advice you gave me? Let me tell you what I did with it. Let me tell you why I didn't take it exactly the way you suggested, but I tweaked it a bit. So they feel like they're part of my decision-making process. So for a young person today, the wonderful thing you have is YouTube. Right. You can get any, anything you want advice on, it's in YouTube. Even I look at YouTube for things like that. So you have the power of this uh, uh, digital uh, sound bites on how to address any problem. Go look at that. Read. Read as much as you can on how other people approach the problem. And look right. for forums where people are discussing these issues. The wonderful thing about the digital world is you can join remotely. You don't have to yeah. journey someplace to join. Even pre-COVID, you could join remotely. And yeah. so I think young people should ta start thinking about how to redeploy some of this video gaming, TikTok, Instagram, Pinterest time to really understanding uh, you know, how, how people did things, how can you learn from them. You've got to redeploy your time. But first, you kind of have to find purpose. And one thing that a lot of young people are struggling with today is finding their purpose. What would you say to the young people that are struggling with that? Ask yourself the question, what do you really want to do in life? Mm -hmm. Now, it's very easy for me to say this because most people say, I want to make the most amount of money. Because if you've struggled, your family doesn't come from much. You know, you want to have a comfortable life. You want to support your family. You want to build a family. So many people will say, I need to get the job which pays the most. And I, I have no issues with people who say that. I understand why they're saying it. But if you really want to get down to saying, what do you want to do? You have to ask yourself the question, what kind of a company and products do I want to be part of? And do I feel good about the direction of the company? Do I feel proud telling people I work for this company? And can I articulate a reason this company exists to change the quality of life for our community and country? If you can do that, then you should work for that company. If you can't and you hate going to work every day, don't go there for just a paycheck because you will be miserable. What's your biggest advice to young women who have big aspirations to do big things or make great change? I'd say dream big. I'd say the next few decades are the decades of women. They need us to work hard and contribute to the economy. They also need us to have kids. So we are the linchpins of the future. So go to the job, lean in with confidence and ask for support. Just ask for support. Come together as a group and ask the company for support. Because people when, have to realize that you can't make it without brilliant minds like, like women, women's minds coming to the workforce. How do you promote women supporting women? Because right now in, in a lot of business and, and military women don't necessarily support women as much as they should. Um, whereas you've mentioned sometimes men will. They, in corporate meetings, you, you've, you've talked about men yeah. really you know, giving good, it's like, hey, you need to fix this, where you've seen women not do that same support for one another. Why, why is that? A challenge, I, and I've never been able to figure out, somehow I feel like because the pyramid narrows, um, women say, look, in this next level, there's only room for one woman and there's four of us. Because they feel constrained by the quota. They keep saying at the next level, there are 10 men and five women vying for the job. I bet the company will say, oh, 20% of the company is women. Therefore, the next level is only 20% women. Right. So it's one woman and four men. So given that, I'm going to have to elbow out other women to move up. I think we have to move from competition to Collaboration and competition. Competition should be there, but you've got to also add collaboration. Why not? Go ahead. 
Sorry, no, sorry, ma'am. And the company should stop saying uh, the quota is only for one woman in the next level. Right. The company should say the best and the brightest are going to be promoted. And if it's all five women, that's okay. And somebody has to show proof that they only promoted the best and the brightest. It's easy to have people who are just like you, think like you, talk like you, with your kind of experiences sitting around the table with you. It's easier to do business. When you bring a diverse brain or figure into the boardroom, all of a sudden the nature of the conversation changes. I would argue for the better, but many right. people would say, I have to change my behavior to accommodate that person. I don't want to do it. I, I was fortunate to get negotiation training. And, and the first day was negotiation doesn't have to be what do you get and what do I get? It can also be growing the pie. Win -win. Yeah. Right. So if you can have a win-win and grow the pie, why is that not a mindset of, of many people of, Hey, it's not you and me against each other, but it can also be us together growing the pie. Because there's more examples of win-lose or lose-win than there right. are of win-win. So we have to publicize as much of the win-win as we do the win-lose. Most of negotiations is replete with examples where one party won, the other party lost. Right. And what, what, one thing that you've, you've done a great job of is, is looking at things from, from multiple different ways. And I think uh -huh. creativity is obviously a way that we can grow the pie is looking at things from different perspectives, not just a, a win lose. And, and you showed that comes from diversity as well. And obviously diversity is, is one of the biggest determinants of success mm -hmm. for a company like Pepsi. And you showed that diversity actually increases performance. How how did accomplishing something like that? So it's no longer a it is you know a speculative thing. It's no diversity is necessary. This drives performance, and I have the proof to show it. I actually have to give credit to Steve Reinem and my predecessor in the job. I hate to say it, he was a Naval Academy grad, a Marine, fantastic chap, absolutely fantastic guy. Steve Reinem taught me a lot. He said, "I have got to get diversity into the company and the boardroom because diversity makes us a better company." Makes, right. leads to better de decision making and the company's employee base should reflect the con consumer base. That was his mantra. And so he went about saying, if I don't get a critical mass of diverse people into the company, we cannot put in programs to build diversity. Right. So I'm gonna spend the first five years bringing the numbers in. Once I get critical mass, I can grow from that. So he focused on getting that critical mass. In. He put in place a scorecard which said, parity hiring, parity promotions. He forced it on the company. We all kicked and screamed, but he was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Once you had a critical mass of people, you could change people's behavior and say, treat this group differently. Don't, you know, don't have macho conversations in front of these people. Talk in a normal way, you know, talk in a way you would with your sister and your daughters. Right. You know, just don't talk like, you know, drinking buddies. Okay. So he effected that change. He gave us training on how to do things differently. And my job was to stand on his shoulders to make sure that I built on his diversity programs. And I made sure that diverse people, especially women and minorities, didn't get evaluated more harshly. We're not held to a higher standard. We're not excluded from discussions because they didn't go out drinking or socializing with the men. So I had to make sure that there was no implicit bias in the organization itself that would derail the career of these women or, or my own minorities. What, why does diversity drive performance? Because you get different points of view, right? Uh, you know, when um, 10 people grow up in the same neighborhood, you know, metaphorically speaking, right. with the same background, the same educational background, their thinking is, you know, sort of monorail thinking. They're right. thinking all one way. All of a sudden, somebody comes and shakes something up a little bit and just asks a different question from a different perspective. All of a sudden, the quality of your decision making goes up because somebody has come in and injected some consciousness into you. That's all. So every study that's been done shows that diverse teams have higher performance levels. Right. So, I mean, in, in human resources, obviously, they're the ones that drive diversity. But as a leader, you drive inclusivity. Yep. And that's a whole different animal as, as just creating diversity. How because do you... you hire somebody in and you don't make them feel wanted and included? You right. wasted time and money on hiring them, right? 
And then you've got a whole group of people who are pissed off because you didn't treat them well. Yeah. So once you commit to diversity, you can't just do diversity. You've got to commit to diverse hiring, mm -hmm. inclusion, retention, yeah. training and retraining, and then over time retiring. You've got to worry about the entire cycle. Yeah. And if you don't, and just get them in, and then don't do the right thing to get them included, Max, that raises a whole different other problem, a yeah. whole different other issue. We, we don't talk about driving inclusivity a lot. We talk about obviously driving diversity and that's, that's the first step, but how do you drive inclusivity? Bad behavior. You know, there are many, many little examples of bias that happen. People don't even realize they are acting in a biased way, but little mm -hmm. examples of rolling your eyes when somebody diverse speaks or right. talking over them or basically writing off what they're saying. So many things we do, little, little things we do. Um, the leaders have to notice this behavior and put an end to it when it happens. Don't wait for to address it many months later and say, you know, six months ago at this meeting, you did this. Nobody's going to remember this. At the end of the meeting, tap the guy on the shoulder, come here. Let me tell you what you did at this meeting. If it had happened to you, you would have felt terrible. Why do you do it to this other person? And you've really got to draw out of them the issues and nip it in the bud. Now, what happens is after every meeting, there's a debrief. People go, oh, my God, not another debrief on inclusivity and race and political correctness. Right. You've got to explain to people, this is not about political correctness. This is about letting each person feel like they're on an equal footing in the company. When you come into work, everybody is the same. So you've got to get that mindset in the company. And the CEOs are as responsible for it as are the other leaders of the company. Do you feel that black people feel that businesses are doing a good job at driving diversity and inclusion and inclusion through their initiatives right now? Well, the thing we have to be careful about, I see progress. That's a good news. What we have to be very careful about is when the winds change in the political system or whatever, suddenly we hire a lot of diverse people. And when the winds change again, we get rid of all of them. That shouldn't happen. We should just focus on hiring diverse people and promoting them. Don't do it because there's some social movement happening or because political power changed. Do it because it's the right thing for the company and the society for you to do it. Understand your motives for why you're doing what you're doing. Do, do you think Hispanics feel the same, that, that businesses are, are also doing an equal amount of participation in diversity inclusion initiatives to, to include them as well? I think the, the people say that both black people and Hispanics are getting more attention now these days than before. My fear is the question we should ask ourselves, are these initiatives um, expedient just because of the situation right. at hand or is it being done because it's the right thing to do for the long-term success of the company? I want us to think the latter, not I want to keep the mobs out of here or I want to keep social media attacks on me out of here. Therefore, I'm going to do this. And guess what? Let's just give this Hispanic or Black people some token job and right. make, pretend as if they're in an important job. Don't do that. It's not fair to anybody. Yeah. I, I think that one thing that is very interesting is that mm -hmm. just because you're a, a successful leader or you you've, you financially have done well doesn't mean you're necessarily good at leading diverse teams or, or your company is. What do you think actually leads to a successful leader that also leads diverse teams and, and is good at it, good at it. Again, um, you know, uh, I had a lot of diversity on my team right. it's because I was only hiring for the best and the brightest. I just said, look, I want the best talent for that job. Mm -hmm. And not just talent for performance, I want potential also. So when I opened my aperture and said, I'm just looking at whoever comes in the door, the best talent right. and the best potential, all of a sudden, I was looking at a bigger pool, and I could pick the right people. If, on the other hand, I said, I want the best XX person, you know, very narrowly defined as one ethnic group or one gender, then I'm really shortchanging the company. And, you know, when I went, I went around the process this way, Max, another thing happened. If I hired a white man, nobody complained because they said, Andrew was looking for the best and the brightest. Right. If a white male was the best and the brightest, so be it. 
I had no issues, zero issues with it. I wanted the best and brightest for the job. I had outstanding white males, I had white standing, outstanding women, I had outstanding Hispanic, African-Americans, but once you brought them in, I got to make sure that nobody feels like they're viewed as a quota hire or a uh, you know, diversity hire, but they're hired for their skills. Then you support them, you promote them, you not first you support them and develop them, give them the tools to do the job, all of the people, don't give some people the tools and some people no tools. Give them all the tools. Mentor everybody. I mean, every. I mean, I've mentored more white males than anybody else, as I have females, people of color, Hispanic people. To me, everybody is an asset to the company. Everybody. How, how, how do you analyze talent, though? We have a talent model. We look at um, core leadership skills, domain expertise. We look at sort of... Uh, uh, you know, potential leadership skills. We have a very clear model and then we assess people against those model, that model criteria. But we also do another thing, Max, we um, send them to assignments or projects which demonstrate their leadership, which can develop and demonstrate their leadership skills. Leadership development is a two-way process. You have to do your part. I have to do work for you. Yeah. Because I see the potential in you, I got to draw that potential out from you. Potential is latent, performance is explicit. So I have to draw that potential out of you. That's my you job as a leader. What, what do you think differentiates highly successful people that are going to go take executive leadership roles? How do you analyze those people? I mean, it's you actually can. Uh, we have a system where even as an entry level person, we can all, almost spot somebody and say, ah, this person's going places. They're very curious. Yeah. Not negatively curious, but positively curious. They are doing a job which is a little bit more than the job they're assigned to. Remember I talked to you about little zooming out a little bit, they do that. Mm -hmm. They go out of their way to make other people feel included. They have a sense of company as opposed to sense of themselves. And they... Um, truly want to um, live a life of integrity and character. They're honest, they're straightforward, um, they're not shady, they don't do things that will cast them in a negative light because they're not those kind of people. It's interesting, you know, we um, interviewed maybe 400 PepsiCo executives, up and coming, high potentials, in-depth interviews. And one of the things that was common amongst I would say 350 or 380 out of the 400, all of them grew up in humble middle-class families who didn't grow up with a silver spoon in their mouth. Right. They worked the hard way. They climbed the ladder. Salt of the earth people. Mm -hmm. All the people. And I think that uh, it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your financial condition was. Mm -hmm. As long as you know the value of money, the value of work, the, the, as long as you know that what you do has got to be bigger than yourself and you act that way, you know, you may not realize it from the day you walk into a company, you're being assessed. Right. And every, every day, every, every hour of the day. You, you were assessed a lot early on, but you also were picked as one of those high executive future talent leadership from an, from an early age. But you also were criticized essentially your whole career. I mean, you had critics um, in your ear throughout, e even till today, I'm sure. Yeah. What has allowed you to consistently prove those critics wrong and endure that harsh criticism for so many years? I had clarity and direction, Max. No, I, I framed a direction which was outside it. I said, what are the, what are the trends happening in the world? And what does that imply for PepsiCo? Right. And if I have to change my strategy, it's because something changed in the outside world. So as long as my strategy was based on an outside-in perspective, every time there were critics, I'd say, why do you think I should change? They'd say, because A, B, and C. If it was always about, because I want more money, I'd say, forget it. On the other hand, if they felt, that something the world had changed and I wasn't changing, I was willing to accept it. I wasn't close-minded. All that I was saying was, give me a good reason why I should change what I'm doing. Right. 
And remember, I, I own a lot of PepsiCo stock myself. So I don't mind becoming more wealthy, but I don't want to destroy a great company. Right. So the company was more important to me than me. Mm -hmm. A lot of these critics, I could have made short term a lot of money and then yeah. out of here. No. What, why didn't you? What, what do you think gave you that moral compass and strong sets of values from, from an early, early age? I mean, I mean, it was instilled in me from the time I grew up saying that uh, anything you do is not about you. It's about mm -hmm. the impact you have on people around you. And I think it's important that we give these messages to young people today in some shape or form. Maybe that's what you're doing, Max. We have to tell people that um, your job is a part of a whole. And you've got yeah. to think of the whole and the whole improving the outcome for everybody. Okay, don't just say, how can I just do my job muscling everybody out from around? Yeah. Me? I'm sure you've seen some of that too. <laughs> Abs absolutely. What what do you think leads to a lot of people losing their character or having character shortfalls essentially in, in their career as they progress and get higher and higher with power? Greed is one. Positional greed or financial greed. I mean, army doesn't give you money, opportunity to make too much money, but positional greed right. and power uh, can uh, change people a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, be very careful about position and power because it's fleeting. Yeah, It can go overnight. And then who are you? Always ask yourself, if my position goes, who are going to be my friends? And what kind of life am I going to lead? Because you'll have thousands of friends when you're CEO. The day you stop being CEO, <laughs> many of those friends who came because of your position disappear. They've gone on to the next CEO. So you've got to decide who your real friends are. And have oh, clarity. You... I'm sorry, no. You have to have clarity. And you've got to make sure that people understand you for what you're going to be long term, not what you are when you're CEO. You, you are probably the most humble person I, I, I've ever, I've ever mm -hmm. met. Um, how, how have you been able to maintain the strong sense of humility when you, you could have, I mean, you, you can have all the fancy cars and private jets yet you considerably donate back to other with, with time and money to situations, organizations, issues that you feel are going to impact the world to do better. What gives you this sense of, of, of humility and also purpose to continue to do good and, and spend and give your time consistently to the next generation. Gratitude. Incredible gratitude. I mean, Max, think of every part of my life. Um, when I went to high school and college in India, um, as I look back, you know, when I studied chemistry, I looked at those labs, they were awful. So I decided when I had the first chance I had money, I rebuilt all those labs. I looked at the women's lounge in the college that I went to. It was a piece of crap. I mean, there were no chairs that were not broken to sit on. So I redid the entire lounge. So it became the envy of the entire college. So I do things out of gratitude. I mean, they gave me the education. They built me into a person of character. Um, you know, when I came to Yale, Yale gave me wings. They gave me an education. They taught me how the public and private sector came together. So I give back to Yale in time and money. I came to the state of Connecticut. Connecticut welcomed me, made me feel part of the state. I give back to the state of Connecticut my time and money. Um, several years ago, I was invited to speak at West Point, uh, just to your uh, senior class. And I spoke with them and uh, all of you young, young, young people, young faces, younger than my kids, um, were getting ready to deploy. And you know, it, it moved me beyond anything because I said to myself, all the freedoms I have here in this country this incredible country are because people like you go out there and give your life to defend the country. Again, sense of gratitude, okay? I have a sense of gratitude towards the United States. I mean, I came as an immigrant. I didn't flee oppression, repression, nothing. I right. came with a valid visa as an immigrant. And I was encouraged and supported and mentored to be successful. I have a sense of gratitude towards the country. So all of this is because of a deep sense of gratitude. That's all. 
so you you live your life obviously that's a that's a key part to your success is gratitude and humility um what about physical fitness and mental health how how important have those two things been to your success so one of the mistakes i made in my early days when i was working so much and traveling so much i didn't worry about my physical fitness i never exercised I would always find reasons why I couldn't exercise because I say, hey, I'm up at four o'clock reading. I have no time to exercise. Right. I come home at eight. I got kids. I'm too exhausted. I didn't exercise. Um, but in the last three or four years, uh, as I was slowing down at PepsiCo, mm-hmm. I'm now disciplined about my exercise reg- regimen. I'm, you know, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat much. But the exercise has made a huge difference. Huge difference. Um, I used to check my emails every half an hour all through the night. Now I only check it twice through the night, maybe midnight and 3 a.m. or something like that, okay? Before, when I was at PepsiCo, if this, if the, if the uh, email system would be at my ear, every time there was a ping, I would be up to check it. That kind of obsession. So now I'm much more focused on myself and I feel better. I really believe the question's a very profound one, Max. You can't do your job well and not wear out unless you focus on your physical and mental calmness and strength. Meditation, just thinking about slowing down your brain, breathing properly, allowing your body to rebuild physically and mentally is critically important. What do you and think family about family plays a big part too? What, what do you think about routines and daily habits? Critically important. You know, it's interesting. Steve Reinerman taught me one thing. He would go to bed at 9 p.m. every night. He used to drive me up the wall because I'm a person that went to bed at 1 a.m. in the morning. Okay? And I said, Steve, why do you go to bed at 9, Steve? He said, you know, routines are important. Right. You'll find out. Recently, I try to go to bed around 9.30. Well, I wake up at 11.30. That's a different question. <laughs> but, you know, I go to bed at 9.30. And i got to tell you, it's fantastic when you have that routine, you get into that discipline and live your life on that routine. It's good for your body, good for your soul, right, good right. for your brain. I really believe in it. You you've you have worked with several highly CEOs, highly successful CEOs, and some of which predecessed you, such as Steve Reinman, who's a Naval Academy and Service Academy graduate. Uh-huh. Have did you notice anything different about Service Academy graduates or their leadership mm-hmm. style? I think all my predecessors in PepsiCo served in the armed forces in some shape or form. I was the only person that did not serve in the U.S. armed forces. Each of them, men of character, you could say that they'd all been through fantastic training. So they were all men of character. Um, I had the privilege of uh, being hired by Wayne Calloway, then Roger Enrico, then Steve. And before Wayne was Don Kendall, who was in the Navy too. I knew him very well. He had an office next to me as an emeritus. So I had the benefit of knowing the four CEOs before me. And they never treated me differently because I was a woman immigrant. They said, here's a talent. I'm going to develop this person. They gave me tough feedback when I deserved it. They just developed me. And so I think what I found about these men, amazing people of character who only cared about talent and competence. And were willing to put in the time and the effort to develop me. So, again, gratitude towards the U.S. Armed Forces for finding these people and developing them that benefited me downstream. You, you never served in the Army. Why do you invest such a considerable amount of time now in West Point and in developing the cadets and faculty here? Gratitude again. I mean, I do it out of a deep sense of gratitude. I regret that I was not in the Army in the sense of, I couldn't also protect the freedoms. Remember, I was born in a democracy. I live in a democracy. And so I didn't, it wasn't even considered okay for women to be in the army those days. Okay, they were not allowed. Only now they're all being allowed. So I didn't do anything to protect people's freedoms. But all of you put your life at harm's way. I mean, you're all children of parents like me. You know, uh, it's uh, painful to even think of the fact that you would be out there in the front facing extreme harm every day. And uh, I do it literally out of sense of gratitude to all of you. 
And so uh, I for West Point is very personal to me. Mm. What, what is your biggest advice to West Point graduates that are set to graduate and commission here at, here at West Point in the next couple of months? First of all, thank you for your service to the country. Thank you for defense of our freedoms. Thank you for everything you do. But I have to say something. Now that I've looked at the curriculum in the BSNL department, the amount you learn is spectacular. I am in awe of every one of you. I've been talking to Everett Spain and Brian Reed, Colonel, Colonel Spain and Colonel Reed, like, wow, the amount you teach these kids and the amount they absorb, because I sit in classes where you're being taught, you absorb all the material. So you are an awesome group of people who are overeducated versus your peers in colleges when you go out into um, the actual frontline deployment. So the first of all, you, you should know that you're leaving with a wicked toolkit of education that is unequaled anywhere. Second is, however long you choose to serve in the army or navy or whatever, you're gonna acquire skills as you go along. But you should also know that at any point, if you chose to step off that uh, track and come back to, or come to private industry, private industry should be glad to have you. PepsiCo is one of the largest hire, you know, companies that hires veterans. I think we're number one in the country. Uh, many, many, many of the veterans have done exceedingly well in the company, exceedingly well in the company. And so uh, we as a company are better off for those people who go out there uh, are extremely well-educated, have tremendous leadership skills, and are people of character, people of character. So I think it's been a privilege working with so many of uh, the people from the armed services in PepsiCo, and I think companies would be better off if they committed to hiring people from the armed forces. And I'll wrap you with one more question, and, and that mm -hmm. is, what what is your biggest advice to all leaders of character, people that want to go on, and do great things. They want to make change and also make this country better, um, whether that be in private sector, that be government, that be military. Regardless, they want to go on and be a character-driven leader. What would your advice to them be? If you come to the corporate world, okay, um, because in the armed services, you have to be leaders of character. Otherwise, the armed services knocks you, knocks you out of the armed services. So that's the great thing about the armed services. When you come to a corporation, to be viewed as a leader of character. Think of doing your job, especially if you're the leader, for the duration of the company, not the duration of your job. So a CEO should run the company for the duration of the company, not for the duration of the CEO. So don't start off by right. saying, I'm gonna run the company for five years, I'm gonna cut, slash, and burn every investment, make a lot of profits and stock price drives up and I'm gonna hightail it. Don't say that. Ask yourself, in 10 years, this company has remained successful. What investments do I have to make today? It's tough to do that. But you've always got to view your job as an enduring job, not a short-term job. You're not on an assignment. You are there to preserve and protect and grow this company for future generations. You know, I talk to the young people in PepsiCo and I always tell them, I am the caretaker of this company for you. So if I don't do a good job, you should hold me accountable. And doing a good job is making the right investments to keep this company uh, vital and rejuvenating over the years. And that was my single biggest responsibility. I wanted to judge my success based on the success of my leader, my successor. A leader of character thinks that way. It's very easy to cut, slash, and burn, make a lot of money, and get the hell out of there. Yeah. Or worse still, do things that pass costs on to society, but makes the company look good. Mm -hmm. Like dumping chemicals in the river or, you know, selling opioids that create addiction, but you make a lot of money. Don't do those things. Worry about the company's place in society. Ma'am, I can't thank you enough. You've been an incredible inspiration to me. I've appreciated every 
bit of advice you've given me today and, and the several conversations that we have had. I, I can't thank you enough for, for being on Leaders of Character and, and helping impact the next generation of leaders and, and really not only talking the talk, but walking the walk and, and continuing every day. Um, being a selfless servant and leader of character to, to our nation and to our world by making it better through all your initiatives and, 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 and really just your, your wisdom and, and your example. So I can't thank you enough. It's been an absolute honor to be with you today. Thank you, Max. Thank you for having me. And thank you for everything that you and everybody in the U.S. Military Academy does for the country. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am.